Hi, I'm Wayne Cassio. As is well known, globalization, the free movement of labor, capital, goods, services, and information is a fact of economic life today. What is less well known is how business processes and business functions change as a company evolves from a local to a regional to a global player. To find out, this year the Sherm Foundation traveled to Dubai, United Arab Emirates, to speak with leaders of one of the region's most successful companies, Aramex International. Its story began in 1982 in Amman, Jordan. At that time, a single company dominated the Middle East courier market, DHL. Competition was limited to non-existent. Aramex founder Fadi Gondour saw an opportunity to create the FedEx of the Arab world. His business model was brilliant in its simplicity. He approached the big American courier companies and offered to cover the Arab world on their behalf. Rather than handing the work to their competitor, DHL, Aramex could be a neutral partner acting on their behalf. They agreed and paid Aramex to ensure that their deliveries to the Middle East arrived on time. In effect, the competition paid the company to learn the package delivery business. Once it became established in the region, Aramex changed its business model. It marketed itself as a Middle Eastern company that could help local companies connect with the rest of the world. That also ushered in a host of new issues as the company grew across the world to new locations and new cultures. Every functional area of the business, information technology, marketing, operations, finance, HR, had to adapt to the new global approach and new direction the company was heading into. We are the opposite of what our competition looks like. Aramex is, is an alliance model, so we don't control the whole globe. We work with partners. So we've got delivery partners all across. Our concentration area uh, is, is within the Middle East, North Africa, Sub-Sahara Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, Central Asia. We're looking at Russia and Brazil. We believe trade lanes have changed and we want to capitalize on those. This has been a homegrown company from uh, as, uh, a simple place like Jordan, uh, growing out to becoming, uh, to even listing on NASDAQ, to becoming, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and now listing on Dubai financial market, to becoming a global player. If you just look at the trade lanes between China and Africa, it's over $200 billion. Trade lanes between India and Sub-Saharan Africa, between Turkey, between the Arab world, facilitating trade is intriguing. We believe being a light asset model is key. You know, no need, no need right now to really buy a plane and fill it up. There's a lot of commercial space around. An alliance model is key for our uh, sustainable growth. Um, uh, positioning ourselves in, in growth markets of our choice is key. The business strategy worked. Aramex was the first company from the Arab world to go public on the NASDAQ stock exchange in New York before returning to private ownership. Then, in June 2005, it went public again on the Dubai financial market. Today, Aramex is one of the leading logistics and transportation companies in the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia, with annual revenue of 845 million U.S. dollars and more than 14,000 employees in 60 countries. Cultural issue is something that you have to take into consideration wherever you go. You need to, you need to understand the culture before you do anything else, because, because what applies in one country might not even apply whatsoever in a different, in a different country or an environment. So if you go and set up, uh, you set up operations in, uh, in India, the way that we operate in India is completely different than the way that we operate, for example, in London or in Holland. So for example, in Saudi, there are things that we have to consider that you would not even think of considering in different, uh, different countries and vice versa. In India, we're an Indian company. In Saudi, we're a Saudi company. In the US, we're an American company. Previously, we were uh, focusing on our home markets, uh, comfort zone if you want, and then uh, we started going out and, and expanding in new geographies, uh, foreign markets, which was new to us. Things got much more complicated. There were plenty of uh, new areas to learn uh, about uh, taxes, uh, legalities, uh, new things to do on the ground. You have to have respect, okay, of the local culture and the local 
local knowledge. We introduced uh, what we call now regional financial controllers who happen to uh, be located in uh, different geographies, so we separated the world into geographies. So there is a regional board uh, head by a regional CEO, and the regional financial controller is part of that board, and this is how we manage the world. Aramix is there for its customers. It, we regard our customers as our partners, and that is why we make sure that the customers and their needs are at the center of every business decision that we make, operationally, financially, um, and even from a technological perspective. Uh, the company started um, uh, with the mindset that instead of allocating budgets on advertising, we will uh, opt to allocate these budgets on enhancing our frontliners uh, uh, training, enhancing um, our technologies, enhancing uh, our operations. So what we do basically is we invest in experiential marketing where whatever we promise our customers, we are able to deliver on in each interaction and at each and every touch point. And this mindset has uh, has carried on with us ever since we started the company. Fadi Gondor retired in 2012, but his dream lives on as the company continues to prosper. Every CEO would like to speak about his company is unique, but what really differentiates Aramex is the core values, values of transparency. Our corporate culture is there is a lot of depth of empowerment, of, of delegation, of, of uh, you know, customer service. One thing that, you know, that, that worries everyone is what happens when you grow. What happens to this organization when you move from 500 people to 13,000? What will happen when you are 20,000? We share things. For example, I was in Egypt you know, uh, last week and um, uh, they have a great leadership uh, program for, for, you know, for um, you know, junior management. When we looked at it, we said, that's perfect. You know? Why are we going to roll it out everywhere? Why should we stay in Egypt? And we made sure, we, we rewarded those people that developed that by saying, you know, you're going to be the owner of that LDP and you are the one who's going to roll it all over. Uh, RMX. I try to get all my people involved in decision-making process. So uh, they are uh, empowered. Uh, I even push them to make decisions. Uh, there is big room for trial and error within the company. So that comes with responsibility, that comes with liability. But then um, they're empowered, fully empowered on, on decisions on the ground. And there's so much to learn in this organization. What is important about that is that the company itself allows you or to, do, to create to innovate, to, to do mistakes, and, to, and, and, uh, and go through risks. I think that's the most important learning uh, experience itself. I think one of the most attractive uh, things in this company is its culture. Every market we go to, we send, you know, we always send people that um, been with the company for a long period of time. They stay there while we're starting the business. So they are our ambassadors, the ambassador of culture, ambassadors of, of, of how we, we run business. The culture is mainly about empowerment. It's about its people. It's about transparency. Over new employees that join the company, they go through a very comprehensive induction plan. So in that two weeks, basically, they, they eat, they breathe, they, 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 everything they do is, is our mix. Yet, uh, middle to senior managers, uh, we take them to our corporate university and also they spend extra time there where we get to know our mix in, in, a, in a closer way. We've had more than 60 nationalities. So really it was part of our fabric. So, you know, it's the DNA of, of, of our mix. I'm a global citizen as well, so I need to worry about the environment, I need to worry about job creation, I need to worry about empowering the youth, empowering the communities. So when we're involved in this, we believe Running a sustainable model is key for our survival as well, and it pays back. Every country we go to, we make sure that we are involved, you know, involved with the community. Uh, I remember there, there was a program where we were developing our leaders. Part of, part of the process or part of the things that they have to do is they have to do a community work. Something you know to give back to the to the community. Uh, this is not uh, this is not something that we believe is, is for marketing. We it's, we do it because this is the, what how how we believe as as a company. Our only asset is our talent. The only asset that we tend to invest and to upgrade and to work on is our talent. What keeps me awake at night is to attract talent, retain our talent. Finding talent and retaining talent 
in the company or in the sales team, since I'm talking about CRM, is one of the biggest challenges that we have on all levels. And I think you'll find that in all other functions, especially in when, when we're talking about customer relationship management. The relation between the people that you have and the customer is extremely important. Customers get used to uh, certain people handling their accounts, handling their needs, and the minute you lose this person, you might risk losing the account as well. And we always promote from within. However, so what we do if we recruit somebody from outside, we recruit them from entry level as opposed to, to, to senior or middle level. Don't parachute expats. I've seen some multinationals doing the same mistake. You, you just send an expat and then, and then he goes and then there is you know, this rotation of two, three years. Yeah. You know, it, takes, it takes time to understand the market. The best way is to you know, look at the local talent. There's a fantastic talent everywhere. You can attract talent, but talent will, will simply disappear if they don't have confidence in you. If you don't have a clear strategy of where you're going to take them from here and, and from point A and to point B and they don't see they are part of the decision making. You have to understand the new generation, what they require. Now they're not looking only for salaries. It's not about you know, salary compensation. What they're looking at is looking for companies that really can address their needs, can, can make them grow, can let them innovate, does not create any barriers. And the most important is that they are good corporate citizens. It takes time to understand the market. The best way is to you know, look at the local talent. You can find that talent, you can, you can train it, you can send people from your, probably from your region or, or corporate office to do the training part. Retention, of course, is not only financial. You know? Retention, there's a lot of other things, non-financial, that will help in retention of employees. Uh, the hurdles that we had to go through uh, throughout that life cycle, and that's what made us stick around because that challenging environment is extremely appealing and exciting. Among our management team, we have an average of 13 years of service. Among our senior management team, we have 17 years of service. Totally as our RMX worldwide of, of around 13,000 plus, we have an average of four years of service. It starts with people and ends with people. Okay, everything in between can be, a lot of what is done in between can be acquired. But when it comes to people, it's very difficult to make sure that you have the best people, you keep them challenged, you keep them in tune of what's happening. I actually have three advices for, uh, for, for women and for young girls, especially in this part of the world. The first one is to set your own expectations. Don't wait to get expectations from anybody. Don't wait for any external expectations. You decide what you want to be in your own life. You have a purpose, you're here for a reason, and you can do it. The second thing is to have the right attitude. And remember that companies, good companies and good leaders, hire for attitude and train for the skills. You need to have the right attitude, the attitude to know that you, you'll, you'll be able to make it, that you have what it takes to overcome obstacles. You have to remember that there's a hidden opportunity in every challenge. So look for it and stay at it and go for it. The third thing, which is the most important for all females, is to ask for it. Statistically, females negotiate way less than men. So um, no, chances don't come knocking on your door, even if you deserve them. No matter in which company you are, you have to ask for it, you have to negotiate. When there's a new job role, you have to ask for it. When there's a new activity in school, you have to ask for it. So um, we women have to do much more of that. I, and I always say, if life doesn't, uh, doesn't give you an offer, it doesn't mean that you don't negotiate. There's actually a fourth advice. Um, you have to look for a company that you're passionate about a or an industry that you're passionate about. Look for a company that you know would empower you as a woman. Look for a company that has women in its management. For instance, at Aramix, we have 20% of women in management. That's, of course, a, a great indicator it's, uh, that, that women are empowered and that they're regarded as the rest of uh, their peers. At Aramix, I think that we're judged by our ability to do the job rather than by our gender. When we acquire a company, we are acquiring, other than the business that we uh, will be acquiring, we're buying into the human capital of that organization. So what is very important is that we make sure that the management of the organization remains and stays on board with us 
okay, to continue with the journey of success. One of the most important uh, and challenging uh, integration issues is uh, obviously people when it comes to culture, when it comes to their expectations, uh, having uh, a foreign company all of a sudden coming in and acquiring them. So uh, what are their intentions? So they ask all these questions. What do you want to do with us? Uh, are we going to stay? Uh, are you going to send your people uh, parachuted from outside? So how are you going to deal with us? Are you going to be better than the previous management? When, whenever we acquire any new company, we try uh, to learn new things from them. We try to uh, understand them better. We try to learn from them. We take the best practices that they have and try to apply them in other countries. Um, and we try to show them what we have as well. I think the integration has to be on both sides. Because sometimes, you know, like example, Berko in, in, in South Africa, they had a great team, they had a good, very good culture. Maybe we learn from them. If there are things that they are doing better than us, we'll take it, we'll embrace it, we will implement it everywhere. You have to tell those people that you're acquiring. We are one team now, and if you have something good, I'm gonna take it and embrace it, I'm gonna appreciate it. And if we have, there is something that I can help you with, I'm gonna give it to you. It has to be a dialogue between both. It's not about dictating. It's about just ensuring that you meet a middle ground where both are happy with what, what, what they have achieved. HR, looking at HR, is, is, is key to our growth, key to our strategy. One key issue here is that as we are growing in our core markets, then we are adding more people in our core market. As we evolved, it became much more critical until a certain point when the HR became extremely vital for our growth and for even the management of each function in the organization. My uh, interaction with HR today is extremely important. Being able to uh, find the right resources in the new markets that we go to. The HR function is extremely important in uh, being aligned with us, in helping us, in supporting us, and in making sure that we are doing things right. Historically, always HR been a more reactive transactional. And HR has to be somebody who really understands the culture very well. Here are five lessons that any company can take from the Aramex experience. One, develop global standards of practice, but allow for local flexibility to meet differing employee and customer needs. For example, Aramex has standards of practice set by the corporate office, but it also allows for flexibility within its local businesses to meet local laws, customs, norms, and employee needs and expectations. Two, build a diverse workforce and leverage the differences and commonalities. Like Aramex, start by hiring a diverse workforce in your home office and immersing new employees in the company culture. Once they are oriented and sufficiently trained, repatriate them to their homelands to leverage their unique mixture of company and local cultural experience. Three, the structure of your HR practices and policies should parallel and communicate the core values, strategy, and structure of your organization. For example, Aramex's RISE compensation system has four levels, Rangers, Innovators, Stars, and Explorers. That system parallels the company's flat organizational structure of four levels. The acronym RISE reflects Aramex's commitment to employee career paths and to its philosophy to challenge employees to rise above the ordinary. The labels Rangers, Innovators, Stars, and Explorers reflect the company's expectations for each level of employee. Four, listen, listen, listen. Learning how to meet the needs of diverse customers, suppliers, job applicants, and stakeholders from multiple cultures means you must listen closely and adapt to local needs. It is often more comfortable for companies that acquire or grow organically to believe they know the business model that should work everywhere. But companies like Aramex that listen closely to key stakeholders are much more likely to succeed. For example, when Aramex acquires new businesses, it learns what works best and spreads the use of these practices to other parts of its business. At the same time, Aramex transforms the new acquisition into a success by using previously identified best practices from around the organization. Five, motivate employees by ensuring that they know both their job responsibilities and their value to the organization. Aramex does this by orienting and educating employees on what they should do, on what they can take initiative to do, and how they bring unique value to the entire customer experience. 
As we have seen, Aramex has been very successful in evolving from a local to a regional to a global organization. It's done this by building and maintaining a distinct and engaging strategy. The company has managed to develop a network of local customer experiences that reflect a larger global commitment to customers. The Aramex culture embraces this strategy through its commitment to learning, risk optimization, innovation, and community and customer service. As you have heard from Aramex executives, the leaders are both transparent and transformational. Its unique combination of strategy, culture, leadership, and execution has led to success. Employee trust, commitment, empowerment, and loyalty are extremely high. The organization's growth and financial success is stellar. Aramex has helped to make the world a better place to live and has positively influenced the lives of those less fortunate. In short, Aramex has fulfilled its promises to its customers, employees, shareholders, and other stakeholders. In this sense, it is truly a global success.